and welcome to today's machine design webcast. Our topic today, how 3D printing supports supply chains, sponsored by Formlabs. I'm Michelle Royal with Endeavors Design and Engineering Group. To begin, let me explain how you can participate in today's presentation. First, if you have any technical difficulties during today's session, simply type your issue into the Ask a Question box and a member of our team will assist you. You can also click on the, quest the question mark help button in the upper right hand corner of your screen. Additionally, we welcome your questions during today's event. We will answer as many questions as possible during the live Q&A session that will follow the main presentation, but please feel free to send in your question at any time. To do so, simply type your question into the Ask a Question box and click on the Send button. Also, please be aware that today's session is being recorded and we will it will be available on the machine design website within the next week. You'll be notified by email when the archive is available. Now, let me turn things over to our presenters and the moderator for today. Mike, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so we I'm really excited for this conversation where I think we're going to have a lot to talk about and uh, is especially kind of urgent and important now for a few reasons that I think we'll dive into. But just to give the audience a quick kind of roadmap of the discussion, uh, like Michelle said, this is um, going to be discussing uh, how additive manufacturing and 3D printing can kind of support the supply chain. Um, and so one thing I kind of want to just use to frame this conversation is the slide that's showing now. This is actually from a report that we released a few months ago uh, where we studied um, or polled about 400 manufacturers about the supply supply chain and about how they're printing. Um, and so the details here, I think we'll actually get into in the conversation, but the take home point here is that um, people who, companies that have adopted 3D printing in the last couple of years are doing so in a really different way than other companies from previous cohorts. And I think that speaks to how the supply chain challenges are, are actually influencing that. So um, as you can see, a lot of people are using 3D printing to help shore up supply chain, to monitor prints and start prints remotely and to produce end use parts as opposed to just kind of prototypes or models. Um, so with that, I think we can segue into uh, the conversation. Um, and I'm excited. We have a really good group here, a, a wide range um, of different uh, viewpoints here that I think will definitely speak to uh, different aspects of this whole program. Um, so to kind of zoom way out, uh, I'm actually going to turn to you, Jason, um, and, and ask a question. They seem simplistic, but I think it's good to get us all on the same page. What is the supply chain and, and why does it kind of pose challenges for companies that make things? Yeah, th thanks, Mike. So uh, first, uh, introduce uh, myself, Jason Fulmer. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Formlabs, so responsible for supply chain and, and operations functions at Formlabs and, and have been in the industry of supply chain and manufacturing uh, essentially my whole career. So uh, so glad, glad to talk today about additive manufacturing and, and, and some of these challenges. Um, so at a macro level, supply chain is is all the processes it takes to produce, distribute, and, uh, and and get products or services to customers. So you can think of you know manufacturing, transportation, sourcing, um, distribution, uh, all, all of those kinds of things. Um, at, at Form Labs, what that looks like it's it's a very complex um, and global network of providers that that uh, allow this to happen. Um, we have uh, portions of our supply chain in over fifteen countries around the world. We have hundreds of unique factories and, and links in the supply chain that, uh, that we use to, to produce product and, and again, get, get it to, to customers. Um, you know, we source directly about 90% of our bill of materials, so we're actively managing um, a high portion of our bill of materials, um, and we, we design and manage the manufacturing process. Um, we use third-party contract manufacturers in some locations. We use third-party warehouses in others, but um, like a lot of hardcore uh, hardware manufacturers, um, you know, we're, we're, we're highly involved in the process. Um, and then finally, we move goods all over the world. So you, as you can imagine, we're buying components um, in various countries. We're consolidating those at a manufacturing site to, to, to build product. And then you know, we're, we're distributing those uh, finished goods to uh, regional distribution centers where they're consolidated and pick, pack, and ship for, for unique customer orders. Um, and probably the very end of this supply chain is installation. And, uh, and uh, some of our higher-end products, um, we offer professional installation services where, where you're bringing all that together and actually help 
helping helping uh, customers set set uh, set products up. So for Formlab specifically, um, you know, supply chain is critical to our business, like most hardware companies. And and without a supply chain, you you, you don't build and, and move product through through the through 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 to your customers. Um, so I think my, my, Mike's question was around um, around challenges, um, you know, in in the supply chain, and and re- really the biggest challenge for any of us is variability in the supply chain. If you know exactly what demand is, you know exactly what supply is. Um, I wouldn't have a career, and supply chain is a discipline what wouldn't wouldn't exist. It, it, it's the variation in the in those things that cause problems and and, and cause the, the the reactions that 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 are that are needed. Um, we're going to talk today about the pandemic and the impact of uh, of supply chain there. But uh, I want to be real clear that. Variation in supply chains not new. It's been around forever um, since, since supply chains existed, um, and and it's could be things like natural disasters that uh, you know Hurricane Katrina in two thousand five like was huge to not only the U.S. supply chains but but global supply chains. Uh, earthquakes and tsunamis of 2011 in Japan, um, you know, you know, huge ripple effects throughout the throughout the supply chain. Uh, one of my favorites, there was a, a volcano that erupted in Iceland in 2010, which people think, how in the world does that affect the supply chain? Um, you know, it, it puts so much ash in the air that planes couldn't fly. And so it can almost completely shut down the air transportation uh, network. So um, so natural disasters cause cause disruptions. Um, labor issues, uh, port strikes, worker shortages, um, you know, uh, fr- uh, ocean freight mishaps. We've had several of those recently in the Suez Canal blockage. Um, and, and, and then demand variation is, is the other very interesting one that, uh, that is demand changes. Um, you may have had a perfectly running supply chain, but you over or underestimated demand and, and now you're, you know, you're forced to react to that. So, um, the, the recent pandemic has exaggerated um, several of these things, but the problem isn't new. And, and I think more than anything, it's brought these problems into mainstream media. And now we're all talking about them, which which is great. And that there, there's a lot of positive uh, positive momentum around changes in in, in the supply chain. Um, for for people like me um, that, that work in supply chain, um, you know, we thrive off this variation, and and it's you know it's it's the excitement of the day of solving the problems and, and finding ways to keep your companies running, um, and and that that's uh, that, that that's that's the cool part about it. So we're going to talk a lot today about uh, kind of hardware and supply related stuff, but maybe one more one more piece of framing before we jump into that, um, and, and I want to just talk about the precursor to a lot of these issues, which is demand variability, uh, and and you know, kind of kind of use that to, to frame up the rest of the discussion. Um, you know, demand seems like an easy thing to predict, and uh, you know, what are we going to sell? Uh, and and a lot of people underestimate the impact of of demand variability. Um, most international supply chains, like Form Labs and, and like a lot of hardware companies, um, their supply chain is anywhere from three to twelve months um, to to uh, to to produce and, and uh, source material and make sure you've got labor and con- ocean containers and materials and all those things to produce things. So when we talk about demand, we're not talking about what you need to produce tomorrow. We're talking about you know nine to twelve months from now what you need to produce, and 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 that's where supply chain variability gets really hard. Um, you know who, who can predict um, the twenty twenty to holiday gift fad, right? Well, what's going to be the popular thing that people are going to buy this holiday season? We don't know. Like, uh, um, you know, who can predict the next natural disaster? Really hard to do. Um, or, or, you know, this crazy pandemic COVID that, you know, we've all been wrong how, how long it was going to last. So, um, you know, re- re- regardless of the supply chain challenges, um, demand is a key force, force of this. It's the thing that we're in the least control of which makes uh, supply chain management that, that, that much more important. Um, and, and the impacts of, of supply chain disruptions are real. In, in the best case, you buy your way out of it and you air freight product or you pay some premiums. And in the worst case, you run out of product and, uh, and, and it impacts your customers or, or, or your market. So um, you know, when, when we think about um, uh, supply chain, it takes one link to break in all of these many pieces to cause a disruption. Um, and, and in the industry, we talk about this as supply chain fragility or how 
fragile is your supply chain? Um, and, uh, and, and we've got to control or, or protect each individual link in this. And, and robust supply chains can handle disruptions, react quickly, and overcome either very, uh, demand variations or supply variations. And, and, and I think a lot of that is, is what we're going to talk about today. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jason. I'm glad I asked that seemingly simplistic question because you gave a lot of good uh, information in that that I think will set up the rest of the conversation. Um, and I'll turn the next question to, to Rich and, and Rich, uh, invite you to introduce yourself to once you start to answer this question. But going off what Jason said, lots of things affect the supply chain and nothing is new with the pandemic about the variability in there. But I think there are some new elements that the pandemic has, you know, like Jason said, either exacerbated or created a new. Can you talk a little bit about what those changes are and the challenges that they're kind of posing when you speak to, to clients? Certainly. Um, so hi everyone, Rich McCauley here, uh, co-founder and CEO of Partsimony. Uh, and at Partsimony, we're building intelligent manufacturing supply chains through data. Uh, helping experts make smart decisions faster as we work with manufacturers. Um, it's very interesting, Mike, um, and I think Jason alluded to a lot of it. Um, if you were to study the pandemic, I think there are two things we need to pay attention to. Uh, first is the concept of multi-tier supply chains, right? So what is a multi-tier supply chain? Um, basically, you have a tier one supplier who's in charge of final assembly, test and packaging, so think like a Tesla. You have your tier two supplier who does all the, all the component fabrication, so things like the manufacturer fender panels, et cetera. And then you have your tier three supplier who does all the raw materials, right? So the sheet metal that goes into the car. And then there's another concept around how has supply chains evolved over the past couple of decades? So starting in the seventies onwards, there was this big movement around maximizing shareholder value, right? Which led to manufacturing capacities, leaving the US to low cost countries like China, Southeast Asia, et cetera. And so what's interesting about the pandemic is that if it started anywhere else in the world, we might be in a different position today, right? It's because manufacturing uh, supply chains was centralized around China, Southeast Asia, and they were the first to shut down. So that exacerbated everything. Um, and so where, where we kind of see the pandemic um, moving strategies in supply chains as we talk to customers is, how do you build resiliency into your supply chain? Um, as Jason mentioned, um, some of the joys of working supply chains, you can't predict anything. So the, the normal operation is uncertainty, but the real key is how do you build the infrastructure to deal with the situation where you can adapt quickly to uncertainty? And that's what kind of parts when it comes in. So in the future paradigm, what we're seeing is the norm is gonna be uncertainty. You're gonna have new supply chain hubs. Um, one of the big things I think what's amazing about added manufacturing is we talked, I alluded to earlier about going to low cost countries. Well, added manufacturing has reduced the cost of manufacturing. So where it actually makes sense to manufacture things locally. Uh, so the new AM4 program in the U.S. that just came out, um, you see more suppliers coming out with added manufacturing solutions as a way to localize manufacturing capacities. Um, so you're going to see a lot of AM solutions driving manufacturing hubs that are going to be localized, which, which is a really, really huge. Awesome. And uh, a perfect segue, I think, you know, obviously uh, the, the meat of this conversation will be about additive manufacturing and how it affects the supply chain. So I thank you both, Jason and Rich, for setting up the kind of conversation about what makes it difficult and, and then where kind of some of the pain points are. Um, and now just to kind of roadmap for the, the, the guests, um, we'll kind of move the conversation to a bit about how additive manufacturing fits into that. And Rich already started to talk about flexibility or localized manufacturing there. And then we'll talk a little bit about kind of new um, tools or new added components to 3D printing and additive manufacturing that are, you know, kind of advancing even as we speak. And finally, we'll end with kind of a, a state of the union and a, a prediction um, period about where the, the puck is, is going, uh, so to speak, and, and certainly want to save some room for um, talking about AM4, which Rich mentioned, and definitely is a very timely piece of this whole conversation. Um, so with that, I think let's fully move into the additive portion. And, and Genevieve, I'll direct this question to you and would also invite you to introduce yourself when you start to answer. Um, but the question is kind of building off what Rich said and where additive does fit in and kind of in the supply chain um, por portion of this or how um, companies think about which elements they should produce in different ways. Um, tell us a little bit about kind of what you're seeing and what you're working on these days from an additive perspective specific to the supply chain. Yeah, sure. So I'm Genevieve Lee. I'm a manufacturing engineer working at Fast Radius. I work with the additive technologies, uh, specifically 
uh, on the SLA form labs and the MJF from HP's uh, printers. We also provide some carbon uh, as well as fused FDM, like fused deposition modeling. So, um, so it's, it's pretty cool. I'm on the floor most of the days working with printers. I get to have my hands on a lot of fun parts uh, from a lot of different customers. So it's, it's definitely really cool industry and I'm very happy to be in it. But jumping back into additive manufacturing and, and supply chain, um, I absolutely agree with what Jason and Rich have been saying. Like this has been like a big issue in the past couple of years and it's really come to the forefront. And additive manufacturing as everyone's kind of been talking about is a great way to add flexibility um, into the supply chain. I think a lot of people know that it's currently, you see more articles around like bigger co companies using it. You see like backpacks and like cars being additively manufactured. Um, and obviously having another manufacturing method, another tool in your tool belt helps everyone. Um, but I think part of like the next problem that we're looking at is like, where are those thresholds? Like, where are those break-even points? So we're, a lot of companies are starting to have a, they're taking a harder look at, you know, really figuring out what cost that is. If there's a higher risk of that supply chain variability, um, what is, is it like a higher cost that we can start building those inroads to like change something that's traditionally manufactured over to additive? So um, I definitely think that that's, one of the great things about additive manufacturing, and I think it's great that we're also pushing the industry to kind of think about more of these ways to make the same part, whether it's, you know, absolutely critical that it needs to be in metal, whether it needs to be injection molded, um, how do we take the same part and have it designed both for IM and additive manufacturing, like simultaneously. And maybe that's easier for some parts than others. And um, I think, building those inroads for additive manufacturing and like kind of flexing those muscles that transferring from one technology to the other is, is something that you're seeing a lot more often with small companies and big companies. And it's like really cool to see everyone kind of embracing additive. Awesome. And it definitely, like I mentioned that survey at the beginning and we're seeing that same thing, Genevieve, right? That people are, like you mentioned, injection molding. There is a push now for kind of um, final parts that are additively produced that, you know, is kind of growing over time, or at least that's what we're seeing. And so kind of follow up question to what you're starting to talk about, which is, you know, in the last couple of years, have you seen that shift at all? Can you maybe talk about a couple examples or hypothetical or real that, you know, might signify that kind of push um, as clients change a little bit about what they're coming to, to you to produce. Yeah, absolutely. We've seen a lot more projects that like kind of the production level recently. So um, a lot of people will have their internal um, printers. A lot of customers will have like that, a form that's SLA, either an L1 or an M2. Um, and they can do a lot of prototyping in-house. So by the time they come to us, we see a lot more of designs that are like refined. Um, the customers definitely know a lot more about 3D printing and it's a lot easier to have that discussion with them on, you know, what's good, what's not so great, how can we design this better? And just makes it a lot easier for us to move it into production and like work with the customers more. So definitely think it goes back to bringing that in-house for them, for like a lot of customers, right? Um, and then really understanding the niche of like, what do we bring in house and what do we like give to other other companies? So we've seen a lot of higher production kind of edging into that injection molding um, space. So, awesome. yeah. And I guess that actually is kind of, you know, you spoke, Genevieve, some of this is an awareness issue, right, about what, you know, you how you can inform people about what they actually can do with 3D printing, which they might not have thought. Rich, I'm curious when you, you know, um, look at this and when you discuss with some of your clients, um, awareness is certainly part of it, but I think there's also changes to the technology that is changing the equation a bit. Can you talk a little bit about how, you know, in the last three, five, seven years, how additive and, and 3D printing has changed in a way that might now be useful uh, to, to, you know, use as a kind of conversation starter with some of your clients. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think, it, and you know, when added manufacturing uh, became more mainstream initially, uh, the use cases were mainly around, you know, one-off super custom use cases or, you know, um, really interesting toys that you could potentially make. Um, and that was due to maybe really just the the performance that was that was available for for end use parts. What's been incredible to see in the whole additive space is just the rapid pace of technology improving the the end use parts themselves, uh, which is why companies like you know Launcher, for example, are using added manufacturing in their end use rocket um, like rocket engines. And so there, there are really two things that really goes into adoption, right? So one is its technology. Uh, improving the end use parts as a viable, more productive um, solution. So, for example, whether it's reducing weights and increasing performance, so whether it's a more effective combustion chamber, whether it's a lighter uh, camber or whatever have you within a specific design. Um, so real productive, um, you know, value add within specific product lines. And then the second thing I'll talk about is more so around increasing optionality in terms of manufacturers, right? So one of the limiting factors a lot of times, especially as you're looking to introduce resilience into your supply chain strategy is how many suppliers can we actually add into our network of backups, right? And one of the most incredible things about added manufacturing is because the CapEx is so favorable, right? So in terms of the startup, the startup costs that you would need to set up a, a productive line in added manufacturing versus, you know, uh, lumps of CNC machines together, having people trained on it, et cetera. Uh, it's really favorable for added manufacturing to where you can actually start a really good added manufacturing shop and really just hit the ground running, right? Which is why you're seeing even you know companies adopt a, a blend strategy of in-house versus outsource. So what's really exciting about added manufacturing, even in the sense of resilience, is because the startup cost is so favorable, you're going to see a lot of more you know actors in the ecosystem, which leads to more options, which leads to a faster pace of innovation. Awesome, and. Actually, kind of playing off that, you know, about optionality, one way, like you're mentioning, is certainly to have kind of redundancies in the supply chain or different ways of, of procuring components or parts. Um, Jason, for you, I know there's kind of another uh, side of that. Um, and I know having, working at Formlabs, I have a little insight into this, but some people are using 3D printed parts in their uh, end products as a way to kind of a different way of adding that optionality, right? Where you don't need the tooling costs or you don't need to change the tooling to have that ability to kind of change or tweak a, a, or iterate on a, a part. So can you talk a little bit about how Formlabs uses um, its own 3D printed parts in our finished products and, and a little bit about that decision matrix? Is it cost savings? Is it the optionality? Is it the iterative quality, all of the above, just kind of walk us through that a bit. Sure. Yeah. And uh, interesting, I'm here at Formlabs because I used 3D printing at my last company to make my supply chain more robust. And I'm not an additive manufacturing industry person, but I've, I'm a, it, it helped me solve bit real business problems. And so when I got the opportunity to, to join the industry, it was very natural because uh, it, it was such a great solution for, for me in previous lives. So, um, yeah, Mike, to, to answer your question, Form Formlabs does use uh, um, uh, additive manufacturing parts uh, in, in our, in our products. Um, and, and I, I will say that there's not one answer that's right for everybody that, you know, I strongly believe every component, uh, in the supply chain, you need to look at it individually and you need to find the right solution, the right supply chain strategy for that specific component. Um, so, so, uh, additive manufacturing certainly, uh, you know, it has faster, faster lead times. You're able to produce uh, unique geometries, um, you know, great for small and, and, and medium volumes, things like that. Um, it allows you to have a distributed uh, manufacturing network. So there's a lot of obvious advantages that Rich and Genevieve have already talked about. Um, you know, some of the disadvantages, though, it, for higher volume parts, if you want to produce a million of something, injection molding is a better manufacturing process. And and and, and I don't think anybody can can rightfully argue argue against that. Um um, and, and so, and so there, there, there is not one size that fits all. You have to look at, look at each, each part and, and make the right decision. I think the biggest gap today in the, in the supply chain industry, manufacturing industry is people aren't considering all the tools that they have available to them. They, they get stuck in the rut of, 
I do injection molded tools and I do, you know, a hundred thousand shot tools and, and I use the same steel and I, and then they get stuck into one way of, of manufacturing and, and designing products. And so um, I think that one of the big things form lab spends a lot of time on and, and, uh, and, and I think everybody on this call is educating others on you know, all these different tools that they have and and they have different options to produce parts and, and helping them with how to make the right decision. You will never hear from Form Labs or, or certainly from me, um, 3D printing replaces all traditional manufacturing. It's just, it, 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 it's, it, it, it's not the truth. So, um, you know, with, with Form Labs being in the industry, we're obviously more progressive in using um, additive manufacturing in our manufacturing process because we know the benefits and we're able, we're able to, uh, to design our own tools and materials and all those kinds of things uh, with, with our own products. But, uh, and and we, we use them for a lot of the same reasons that, that, that I'm sure everybody's heard about, um, you know, prototyping and speed to market early in the design process. Absolutely. Um, you know, flexibility for change or quality issues where, where we've got concerns um, uh, or, or variation within a part, um, you know, and at the end of the day, we can we can get changes in our additive manufacturing supply chain cut in in about three weeks as opposed to traditional manufacturing that's going to take, you know, 10 or 12 weeks. So, you know, things that, that, that we're concerned about or we want to have that flexibility, we, we purposely drive it in. Um, and then th then we purposely design in 3D printed parts uh, for flexibility, for customization, and for cost advantages. Um, you know, based on volume, there is a break-even point where, where 3D printing is a cheaper supply chain. It is a, a more cost-effective supply chain. So I, I think the the, the, the biggest answer, Mike, is you, you have to understand all the tools you have and you have to look at each part to, to, to make make the best decision you can for, for each part. And, and you know, Form Labs, we're, we're challenging ourselves every day to, to, to push the boundaries of where that break even point is. And, and we, have, we have the advantage of our own machines that we're using. And so we know what works for us and what doesn't work for us. And we use that to design in the future of, of our machines. We also look at materials um, in, uh, you know, I, I don't have a material that matches an injection molded material. So let's put that in a roadmap. Let's see if there's a business case to produce that for other customers. Um, and, uh, you know, things like high volume post-processing um, is, is a big challenge in additive manufacturing. And we're spending a lot of time there. Um, so so, so we're, we're doing a lot of things in our product lineup to help form labs, but also the rest of the industry. Um, and then we're doing several things like Rich, uh, Rich has already talked about of um, printing in our factories all over the world as opposed to in a central location and, and diversifying, um, having small print farms all over the world to, to, to uh, have redundancy and, and burst capacity where we need it. So um, 3D printing is a big part of our supply chain and it grows every year. We, we, we find new use cases uh, and, and, and new value that, that it adds to our supply chain. Great. And I guess kind of building off of that, you know, one kind of recurrent message coming from all of the three of you is that it's not just additive manufacturing or traditional manufacturing. It's kind of understanding the choices that are out there. Um, you know, curious, again, in the lens of the pandemic for you, Jason, has that changed? You know, I know you said these challenges aren't new, but is there anything that has kind of change the way you think about maybe being more proactive in the supply chain or, you know, pushing those thresholds or trying to take more risks because of the light of the pandemic exacerbating some of those problems. Yeah, the the pandemic uh, makes us all kind of say, why didn't we do this 10 years ago or five years ago, right? Um, but, uh, but but we all also try to not have the bullwhip effect that says, let's go, let's go, you know, get rid of traditional manufacturing and, and bullwhip the other way. So I, I think the pandemic has has forced us to to spend more time and energy talking about re robustness, resiliency within our supply chain, spend more time finding those weak links and finding um, strategies to, to, to resolve those. Um, but I want to need to be careful that it's it's a tough balance, right? That uh, that full redundancy in anything is is so cost prohibitive that you know it would you know form labs can't support it. No no company can support it. So that, that the key is finding the right 
weak links in your supply chain and, and, and focusing on those um, and additive manufacturing, 3D printing could, could be could be a, a, a great, great area to, to, to solve some of those. Um, uh, but it doesn't solve them all. And, and, and so so the 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 more that all of us in the industry can bring down the cost, can make it easier to use, can make high volume printing and post processing accessible to people. It's it, it makes that tool that much more valuable, um, and and it is the problem solver for for more gaps or more weak links in your supply chain. Great, and I think I mean actually that's a a good point. Not not every company is knows enough about three D printing like Formlabs does to know exactly the right decisions to make about which parts to you know produce traditionally or which use added to manufacturing. So, you know, turning it over to you, Rich. I assume your clients have a wide range of of experience and 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 you know familiarity with different options. So I'm curious again, kind of in the light of the pandemic, have you seen that shift at all? Have people come and asked you more about it, or you know, kind of pushed on specific elements? that they might not have three years ago. Just tell us a little bit about kind of the changes in, in requests or, or, you know, kind of um, outcomes that people are looking for. Absolutely. So at Partsimony, uh, we look at supply chain management from a holistic standpoint. Uh, what that means is we you to really drive proper supply chain strategy, you need to marry engineering into it, right? Um, so to the point that um, was made earlier, whether it's Knowing when and how to use 3D printing within your within your supply chain really matters. So what we do at Parts and One is we use data to marry the engineering data, to supply chain data to provide recommendations. So our job at Parts and One is to reduce the cognitive load of experts to make smart decisions faster. So it's identifying where are the key candidates for added manufacturing, and then for those components, who are the right suppliers that could be inside your existing network of suppliers that you already work with today or outside your network that you can discover and work with them. Um, in terms of supply chain management strategies that we're seeing, um, what's interesting is it has to do with fragmentation, right? So again, redundancy, you need to have more supplies within your network um, as a backstop, or you're migrating supply chain away from a high risk area to a lower risk area. Um, you know, Jason talked about, you know, we can't really predict what's gonna be next. Uh, it could be a hurricane. Uh, it could be flooding. We don't really know what might happen. A port could shut down. Um, and it's really about building the infrastructure to deal with that chaos, um, which leads to, you know, increasing complexities into the actual supply chains, right? So the, how do you now make a smart decision on where, where are the right places to go to, um, where are the right redundancies to have within your supply chain? How much is too much? How much is not not enough, right? And that's what kind of parts when it comes in. So it's to to really solve the supply chain issues about marrying the engineering to, to the actual supply chain data sets. Great. And I think actually that kind of brings up a natural question for you, Genevieve, too, which is, you know, you're you kind of started to talk a bit about this with end use parts and different workflows. Um, going off of what Rich was talking about as kind of, you know, people try to find new uses for 3D printing. Can you talk through a little bit about what those newer workflows are and kind of what you're working on, you know, kind of pushing the bounds and, and helping your, your customers push the bounds too is what can be produced additively? Yeah, of course. Uh, we have actually been seeing a lot of like high customization, but also like medium scale parts, things like medical prosthetics or um, like medical models, um, drones, like seeing almost a prototype, but in like a medium scale production. Um, so it's been very interesting. You see a lot of customers really leveraging like the fast iteration um, and then the ability to change things very slightly um, for a lot of different people. Um, and I think some of the newer trends on the flip side of that is uh, customers are really not only just really well versed in like designing for additive now, um, there's also other customers who are really needing uh, like some more input. They like really value that discussion with the manufacturing engineers. Um, and I think moving forward, you are seeing there's not enough manufacturing engineers with additive knowledge, I think, especially at this point. So it's kind of like teaching other companies, but also um, if you look 
at traditional manufacturing, you see software that it's almost built in. It's like very smart. It knows when, um, say for CNC, when you use a CAM software, it knows like what kind of machine you should be using, whether it's a three axis or a five axis uh, mill. And I think um, in some sense, additive needs to catch up in that sense. I know additive is the future, but if you look at all of these traditional machining uh, manufacturing methods, they've had all these years to kind of catch up and build that software. And I think in that sense, additive needs to kind of leverage that and really build build those smarter functions and make it even easier for customers to get their feet wet in that sense. Um, I think in the words of one of my mentors, he he always says, innovation is just imitation with a twist. And that's, mm. I think, pretty fitting here. Definitely. And it sounds, I mean, just to kind of build on what you're saying, it sounds like there's kind of two ways of thinking about it, right? There's, can you work with your clients to understand what's possible? And then how can the industry itself kind of keep pushing what's possible and tying in a little bit to what Rich and Jason were saying, whether that is kind of, you know, lowering the threshold of what makes sense financially to do it, or it could be, you know, new materials or new hardware that make it easier or new software that made it easier. Um, to go back a little bit to what you said at the beginning in your intro, you, you know, you're, it's exciting to, to be this. You, you know, you enjoy some of these new challenges coming your way. I'm curious, you know, in kind of light of all of that, like where the technology has improved, where the awareness has improved and just kind of what you're working on, what is exciting to you now? You know, what is kind of something that you're pushing yourself to learn a bit more about or that on behalf of your customers, you're kind of trying to, to learn and accelerate the, the growth there as well? Yeah, I, honestly, I really enjoy like teaching manufacturing, like, Topics like how to design for IM. I've talked about or AM. I've talked about that a lot, but um, it's really cool to see. There's some design rules for IM, like injection molding, that are very similar to additive, right? Like the thickness of parts is better for AM if you kind of keep it even all throughout, similar to injection molding. So I think you see a lot of customers move a little bit closer to kind of that digital workspace. So some, I think a lot of times you see some customers still hand drawing a lot of their, their models and seeing more and more customers where everything's like much smarter, um, really influencing that has been great. And if you, we have manufacturing, it, it's currently a little bit of a black box, like with the supply chain volatility and everything. But if you had like a pizza tracker, if everything's as easy as like ordering a pizza, right, that would make things a lot easier. But I think just seeing it open up a lot of doors is really cool. And then like working with other engineers, like kind of design with that flexibility in mind is is pretty neat. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing that's coming up again and again, so I'm going to kind of um, interject this and, and pose it as a question to Rich, but I think also set the stage because I've heard a lot from all of you that, you know, and, and going back to what you said, Jason, and kind of in some ways the pandemic makes us realize that we could have been doing some of this a while ago. I think there is a way that the pandemic is kind of a forcing function for, you know, hey, we need to do this in a new and innovative way. And that might actually yield better results, but we were never kind of pushed to do that. Um, so for Rich, I'm you know, curious kind of to, to spell that out a bit more are there we've talked we've talked a lot about what's negative with the pandemic and uh, and definitely the the difficulties it's posed for supply chains um or is there a silver lining has it helped you or your customers or the industry at large think of okay now let's actually invest in this let's learn you know what what are if any some of the positives that have, out, have come out of this kind of forcing function yeah, I, I think one of the one of the major positives of, of just COVID um, and the pandemic was accelerating the adoption of of viable technology. Um, so before the pandemic, you know, Adiv was already somewhat mature um, and it was still a viable use case. But you know, engineers um, or you know, OEMs for the most part were stuck in their ways. Right, we've always been doing this part with CNC or injection mold. We're still going to do this. And it wasn't to their option was shut down and they, they were forced to think, OK, how can we actually think from a first principles mindset? What, what are some of the ways we can actually make this? Uh, a couple of use cases, um, specifically 
One is around, you know, you know, nasal swabs, for example, um, which is huge. I mean, this is, it, this probably helps save a ton of lives where people, you know, 3D printing potential nasal swabs or what have you in lieu of, you know, injection molding, right? Um, we were fortunate to be part of a, a team that helped manufacture ventilators. Some of the components we ended up 3D printing, right? Because it was, it was going to take too long to wait for the parts to be fabricated. Um, and we were able to iterate really, really quickly. So these are, these are viable use cases that are being rapidly adopted. I think what people are going to find are the improvements in the products that end up getting made, I, I think is going to go up. Um, where you know added manufacturing opens up a wide range of options in terms of how you can design any given product. Um, so you're going to see more customization, uh, which I think is going to be better overall. But I, I think it's mostly one of the gifts of the pandemic was just a mindset change um, and awareness of all the viable options that are out there. And now it's, it's just about how do you marry the options that are out there into specific use cases that make the most sense. Awesome. And I think that's a, a perfect segue kind of this last uh, third or quarter of the, the conversation before we turn it over to some questions from the attendees, which is basically, you know, predictions and kind of what's next. Right. So we've talked a lot about what the supply chain is and how it was affected by the pandemic and, and how that's kind of accelerated um, the adoption of AM in a lot of different ways. Um, and so I think this is good for all of you to, to chime in. But I'll start with Jason. Um, what, you know, what coming out of this, where do you see, um, you know, this evolving the industry and maybe even, you know, with your non AM background, just thinking even more largely, what, what do you think this means for current, you know, people who do manage supply chains or companies that are really starting to build out their processes? What do you think the kind of learnings from this are? Yeah, I, I completely agree with Rich that, uh, that the pandemic is kind of Force this this conversation, and it's it's more radical change needed now. And the pandemic has has made us open our eyes to that. Um, you know, I, I've been in supply chain manufacturing my whole career, so you know, uh, optimization, flexibility, creativity, like those are not new things to to supply chain. Like that, that that's always been the case. Um, I was at Dell Computers in in the in the two thousands when we were first offshoring manufacturing, and we were flying computers from from Asia to service the U.S. market, like that was that was com thought of as absurd back then, and now it's kind of mainstream. So, so that that innovation is 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 always part of supply chain. But the but the pandemic is just refocusing us again. That you know we, we've got too focused on optimization and not enough on flexibility and uh, and 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 resiliency. And and so so I, I think it's going to focus. You know, all everybody in in my type of role at, at hardware companies to, to to be able to refocus there. Um, the supply chain is always going to be dynamic. It's always going to be fragile. There's always risks and, and disruptions in it, and and you know, good companies find ways to to deal with those. Um, and and again, out of manufacturing is going to be a big piece of it. I'd say that the other thing that has really that the pandemic and I'll say the last ten years has really driven is. We've been accustomed to speed, and we've been a, a, a fulfillment and speed of products. Um, and and customers don't wait, and customers aren't going to wait. And and if you have a slow or long supply chain, you're going to lose business because somebody will find a way to to get it to customers faster. And and that's you know that that's more and more important. And you know, I, I say all the time, Amazon ruined supply chain for a lot of us, but it it, it really. It, 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 it changed, changed expectations with consumers and added manufacturing, you know, fast, lean, close to close to demand supply chains are, 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 are going to be are going to be big into the future. Um, so, so as I think of you know, 3D printing, um, I think it's all it, it's a great risk mitigation tool that we've talked about. I think it's a great supply chain optimization tool that we've talked about. Um, and, and I think people in, in my my job in, in various companies, you're foolish if you don't have it in your supply chain somewhere. The question is where? Um, the question is, do you use third parties to, to, to have that capability? Do you do it in a centralized print farm? Do you have it di distributed to each of your manufacturing sites? But but it, it, it has to be part of the supply chain. The, 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 the big question is where. Um, and, and I think beyond how we use it, what's even more exciting to me is it it's helping create 
new businesses and, and new markets. Um, you know, and Genevieve talked about several you know new products and, and industries that she's supporting, but we're helping to create industries and specifically around mass customization where where you need you know a lot of very customized parts. And you know the the, the, the poster child for this is the dental liner market that is built off. Of, it wouldn't exist if we didn't have 3D printing. Um, and there's there's so many more examples like that that are early stage or going to be market changing, uh, um, you know, companies. Um, you know, I think, you know, we, we've gotten used to standard offerings because that's all traditional manufacturing will support. Um, but that's changing quickly. And, and, and I think what we will move to, 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 to custom offerings and a lot of different product segments over the, over the next several years. Um, I, I think of software as a, um, as an example here, you know, you, we all used to have the same interface on our computer, on our TV, on our phone, and we would have one software platform, one interface, one operating system, one login, you know, things like that. And, you know, software has been well ahead of mass customization. I think hardware is catching up quickly. So, um, so yeah, I, I think that's it. And then, and then, you know, maybe final point is um, because additive manufacturing is becoming more mainstream, it's getting more attention, more publicity, more, more, more people are thinking about it. Um, uh, way that there's last week the, the the White House announced the the AM Forward program, which I think uh, Rich or Mike, you may have both mentioned it. Um, a pact between manufacturers um, and, and smaller suppliers that are producing and promoting and, and advancing additive uh, technology. So, um, so I, I think I think it's another great example of how important this is to build resiliency in the supply chain and how not only large companies like GE uh, um, and Honeywell, Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, but are, are supporting it, but also our, our government and not just the U.S. government, but other governments around the world see the importance of this. This and 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 we'll continue to uh, to to help drive the adoption throughout the the global supply chain. Great, and yeah, I'm I'm, I'm glad we have a chance to discuss AM Forward. There's a, a bunch of questions in the chat about it, so maybe it's actually a good time to kind of spend a couple minutes on it, and it ties into the prediction thing. So. Rich, maybe I'll start with you. You know, um, if if you feel up to it, kind of give a, a description of what you understand the AM Forward initiative to be, um, and then maybe talk a little bit about kind of what this might mean. You know, for five to ten years from now for the AM industry as a whole. Yeah, I, I think um, even just alluding to the previous question around where some of the silver linings of of the whole pandemic was a real realization of just the deficiencies within supply chain within the U.S. Um, and this is some of the reasons why the, there was a tariff war to begin with um, before everything else. Um, I think, you know, the U.S. government, I think, has invested over $200 billion in just manufacturing capabilities and capacity within the U.S. Um, with the AM4 program, some of the things that went really well, they were, they were legislated or included. Uh, one was around training. Um, so Genevieve alluded to helping engineers to understand, you know, some of the trade-offs of, of added manufacturing which will reduce the cognitive load of the experts, which is very keen to in terms of increasing the speed of, a, of actual adoption. Um, you also have, you know, companies like GE, uh, and I believe the other one was um, uh, Raytheon, that specified that they're going to be targeting SMBs, um, which means that they're going to order from uh, or give POs to small companies that do use added manufacturing. I think it's going to be a huge benefit for, you know, new entrants to the markets. Uh, to win uh, using added manufacturing technologies uh, that necessarily wasn't there before. Um, so I, I think with, with increasing demand uh, locally and also increasing the capabilities locally, it's going to be huge um, in terms of redundancy as well. Um, then now comes the, and I think everyone on the panel has alluded to from Jason to Genevieve around, there's so much going on today, right? There's so much uncertainty, so many different trade-offs within your engineering decisions or supply chain decisions. It just becomes about how do you reduce the cognitive load to make smart decisions faster, right? So, so um, Jason mentioned, you know, hardware has been, you know, fast at it um, and really software's catching up. Uh, the real thing around supply chain experts who spent decades in the industry, uh, I'm sure Jason can definitely relate, where they know what they're doing, right? But the problem is not like they don't know what they're doing. Their problem is their tools are failing them. They, they, their tools are, are slowing them down. Um, and that's what kind of parts when it comes in is marrying the data together to help experts to reduce the cognitive load so they can make smart changes faster. Got it. And I think, um, Genevieve, this brings 
a good point um, in the conversation to you, which you mentioned, and I think Rich just alluded to, you know, there's changes to the technology and certainly improvements there, but there also seems to be a, a training issue here. Um, and, and I think AM Forward even points to this too, with kind of investing in education. And I think you mentioned it as, you know, they're just engineers aren't always as aware of the options um, available to them. So curious just for your thoughts, again, kind of in the prediction view, what do you see as kind of helping uh, solve that problem of getting, you know, kind of more and more people who feel comfortable with the technology to help solve these problems? Yeah, of course. I, I think reaching out to third parties, like if your company, you know, doesn't have like anything, any infrastructure built in for that, I think there's definitely other companies. There's plenty of 3D printing companies, fast radius. My company is, you know, it's one of them that offers that expertise uh, if it, it's something that you need to get your feet wet. Um, and I think if we bring it back even a little more, when I was in college, like eight, 10 years ago, they were just starting up additive manufacturing courses. So I, I think at this point, there's probably so many, you know, design for additive in addition to design for, you know, other manufacturing methods that are being included in the curriculum of, of different universities. And um, I think that is only going to help. Um, so, yeah. And uh, I, I, this conversation, I think, could go on for hours, and this is super valuable, but I do want to make sure we get to some of the questions. And we already addressed a couple with the AM Forward and the training, but one that has come up from a couple people, and so I think is a really good thing to talk about, is some kind of concrete examples. So I think we've talked a lot about the philosophy behind it and kind of how you make choices, but curious if any of you can give an example to the audience of a of a specific part that may have been, you know, produced in a traditional man, uh, method before, but now is produced additively or some other example that can bring this home to, to show a concrete point. So happy for anyone to jump in an example. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take one uh, from, from Form Labs. Um, you know, we recently launched um, a Cure L product, a, a large cure that uh, middle of last year, you uh, some of you may have seen. Um, th there's a gear underneath the turntable that we were unsure the exact uh, you know how the gear was going to interact with with other other pieces um, so we we as part of the design process we intended for that to be additive manufactured to start with and believed it would eventually move to traditional manufacturing as we got to volume um, and and the the flexibility of additive of 3d printing worked great we 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 built it on our fuse sls printers and, and it was great what I'll say we didn't expect um, or, or was maybe even a little bit of a surprise to us. We got to the point of, all right, it's stable. We know what the design is. Let's go get the cost that we've been producing this ourselves of additive manufacturing in our Fuse SLS machine. And, and let's go do the business case of how much we're going to save. And people came to me, Jason, we're ready to save a bunch of money. You're going to love this, right? And we really found there was no savings in moving to, to traditional manufacturing, that we were able to optimize the, the, the SLS build chamber to, to put pack so many of these parts in, in one build chamber that the volume was under that break, that break even point. And, um, and what, what was initially thought to be just design flexibility and NPI flexibility, we've left that part as, as SLS or, or fuse manufactured um, for, for every uh, cure L that, that, that we've shipped. So um, even form labs that, you know, we're in this industry, we kind of underestimated the, the, this trend uh, or that this, this specific part and, uh, and, and found, found it was best to leave it in the AM supply chain. Awesome. I, I think I have a similar example. It's pretty much the same example, but um, one of our like longer term customers has come to us for um, creating this housing and they're eventually moving to injection molding. Uh, but it's it's a pretty complex part. We've been making it for them uh, for the past two, two and a half years now. Um, and I think they've been saying that they're going to injection molding and we've been kind of supporting them and covering all their supply chain so far. And I think it's the complexity of it. Um, and uh, in addition to the lightweight uh, material that in, like additive offers, um, so it's going on like a transportation uh, product. So it, I think it's working right now, like the um, initial upfront cost of like making the mold, designing it, doing all the testing is just really prohibitive. And so it's, yeah, at this point they, 
additive is there's the supply chain, even though they were originally planning to go to injection molding. So interesting. Rich, you have a concrete example to provide? Yeah, I'd say a lot of our customers tend to be in, in the low speed uh, EV segment. Um, and when you're looking at the low speed EV segment, uh, weight savings actually helps with overall uh, efficiencies. So we're seeing customers opt to use 3D printing in terms of alternatives to normal fabrication methods. Um, I think you're going to also see increases in other fields, just even outside the mobility space. Um, you can think of you know medical devices, or maybe it could be hip transplants or whatever have you. Uh, and there are other use cases in fashion, right? Uh, we, we tend, as engineers, we tend to talk about industrial applications and products a lot, um, but there is a, a really big use case around added manufacturing for the entire fashion industry where customizations is highly, highly favored. Great. Well, I think we basically have one, time for one more question and I have a good one uh, from the audience here that kind of ties a lot of this conversation together. So I will uh, ask that and then kind of let you guys uh, pick who wants to answer. But I um, want to thank you all for this conversation. It's been really interesting and, and thank the audience for submitting some really good questions too. So uh, hopefully we got to most of them, but um, there's a lot more. So I think there's a way to ask uh, the participants even after the webinar. So um, to get to that last question, it's kind of, again, like I said, tying everything together. So in the next five to 10 years, again, under this kind of prediction mentality, a lot, you've all mentioned different ways that um, AM can be used. And so curious to kind of hear a little bit more about where you personally expect it to grow. You know, Genevieve, you mentioned housing. Jason, you mentioned kind of internal components. Rich, you started to mention mass customization. All of those, I think, are slightly different. We didn't even really talk about, you know, manufacturing aids like jigs and fixtures. So under that umbrella of kind of the possible areas that will grow more than others, um, curious to just kind of get your your final thoughts on, on if, you know, you had a crystal ball 10 years from now, which of those tra traditional manufacturing techs you think will be kind of most supplanted by AM or kind of a mix or other you know ways of approaching that? Yeah, uh, I guess I, I, I could start. Um, I, I think I think um, one segment that we haven't talked about is around spare parts. Um, I think if, so I, I come from the whole like aviation industry um, and there are certain components that have been like obsolete, right? Um, especially if you look at like the DOD programs. Um, and added manufacturing is a viable solution to manufacture spare parts for those obsolete components that are not necessarily being manufactured today. Um, and I'm talking about billions of dollars worth of parts, right? Um, and if you look at even just like in-home use, right? Um, if you break something like a fridge handle or whatever have you, um, you're not necessarily going to order a new fridge or you're not necessarily going to go to Home Depot and order just a specific fridge handle. You know, added manufacturing could be another viable solution. So I, I think the spare parts market is something that is really, really big um, and it's going to be industry specific, whether it's aviation, whether it's apparel or appliances, whatever have you. Right. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk maybe more supply chain uh, focused. That's uh, my, my, my career. Uh, I've seen a lot of transformations in supply chain. I mentioned, you know, the transformation from U.S. to Asia or Mexico to Asia. Um, you know, automation in the supply chain. I think this is just another um, permanent trans tra transformation in the supply chain. Additive manufacturing will be part of most products 10 years from now. Um, and and they, they it won't be the entire product, but there will be suppliers or companies will find where it adds value and there will be pieces of additive manufacturing in, in many of the products that we buy. Um, and and I, I really believe this is a permanent transformation. It's it, it's not a it's not a fad. It's not a, a niche thing. We're going to look back 10 years from now and say, why in the world did we do that stupid supply chain where we you know, waited 10 weeks to get a tool and we iterated on that 12 times? And, you know, everybody bought the same size you know, ring or sunglasses or, or earbuds or whatever. Like it, 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 it's it's going to transform the products that we buy um, as consumers and the way all companies manufacture them. Great. Well, you're right against the clock, Genevieve, but if you have anything to add, please now. Yeah, I'll give it a quick. Definitely agree. Uh, I think I've seen actually some parts with additive manufactured, like parts on it, which is pretty cool. But I also think flip side of that, um, if you're looking at on the floor lines, assembly lines, like additive manufacturing is so easy to just make jigs and like tools for your process that it 
also helps helps us on the manufacturing side, like make things smarter, make things easier for everyone. But um, yeah, I definitely think it's, it gives, it like kind of allows us to branch out more for a lot of different products. So, yeah. Well, I think we hit all the major applications and it looks like everything's going to grow. Uh, I thank you again for all your time and I'll pass it over to now to Michelle just to, to wrap it up. But I, I appreciate everyone's time. Okay, thank you, Mike. And um, as he said, for those questions we didn't have time to answer during the live event, we will be getting back to you via email. Um, so that concludes today's presentation. And on behalf of Machine Design, I'd like to thank Jason, Rich, Genevieve, and of course, Mike for the great presentation and to Formlabs for sponsoring today's event. And of course, for all of you for joining. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.